Happy to have with us here in New Orleans at ASH 2013 is Dr. Ramon Tu from the Cleveland Clinic, a presenter yesterday. Tell us about this poster, sir. Oh, thank you again, Tom. Uh, so we presented a poster uh, on uh, modified dose escalation of ruxolitinib, ruxolitinib in uh, myelofibrosis and uh, the feasibility of this approach in treating patients with myelofibrosis. Uh, so this particular uh, topic is quite uh, timely uh, for the simple reason that uh, we are still trying to determine what is the best way to actually dose these patients when they're started on treatment. So you're really trying to look at effectiveness versus safety and side effects, correct? So that's a great, uh, you know, great point that you're making, Tom, because as we know, the effectiveness and safety profile of the drug are two things that must always come hand in hand in order for us to really appropriately treat the patients. You know, uh, of course, we want to get all the benefits that we want from the drug, but it must not be at the expense of the side effects that also develop. So these two things must, all, must always come hand in hand. And currently, of course, with, with the approval of ruxolitinib in the treatment of myelofibrosis patients, uh, we've really come a long way in how we manage patients with myelofibrosis. Uh, we don't really have a lot of good therapies before, but this treatment has really made a huge difference in patients with myelofibrosis. Uh, the current way at which it's being dosed is that if you have a platelet count that's above 100,000 uh, to about 200,000, you basically give a dose of 15 milligrams twice a day. And then if you have a platelet count above 200,000, you basically start with a dose of 20 milligrams twice a day. Uh, recently, there was also uh, FDA approval for patients with 50,000 to 100,000 uh, platelets, and you could start these patients with 5 milligram twice a day. But the concept behind this particular study is, again, uh, most of the patients that were initially treated in the two pivotal trials that led to the approval of this uh, particular agent in myelofibrosis uh, saw a, a large proportion of patients developing anemia and sometimes transfusion dependency during the early phase of treatment. Uh, for sure, uh, some of these patients, after an initial dip in their hemoglobin and became anemic, they usually recover back. But of course, for a typical physician in the community, this is kind of difficult to sometimes assimilate. You know, The basic premise in treatment of most myeloid malignancy is that we think, oh, we always have to cite to reduce the disease. But we have to remember what were the primary endpoints of those uh, particular trials. They were a reduction in spleen volume, okay, which of course translates to a reduction in spleen size in clinical practice, and also an improvement in total symptom uh, score of these patients. So with that being said, since these are the two primary endpoints, uh, we have to keep in mind what do patients with myelofibrosis patients actually uh, suffer from or what are their issues. And this can be varied from different patients. There are patients of mine who may come to my clinic. They have an enlarged spleen about eight centimeters, but they're not necessarily symptomatic from it. Uh, yet that same patient may have a lot of fatigue and therefore that's the main issue that I would like to address. So given the fact that you know, there are patients who develop both hematologic and non-hematologic side effects related to the high doses of treatment, I actually use a different approach where we start off uh, from a low dose escalation going up to the desired treatment that, or dose that we would like to achieve. So let me give you an example. The way that I do it is I start off with five milligrams every other day. Uh, usually uh, I continue this for about four weeks Afterwards, depending on the desired response I wanted to achieve, may it be, let's say, fatigue is the bothersome symptom or night sweats, we increase the dose by another five milligrams, so that becomes five milligram once daily, and basically uh, keep the patient for that uh, dose level for four weeks, see how they tolerate the treatment and the necessary response. If, for example, uh, believe it or not, there are patients of mine who are just on the five milligram once a day dosing, and they've already achieved the desired response that they have. Because again, if my original intent was uh, improvement of night sweats or fatigue, once I've achieved that, when they don't report it anymore, what is the benefit of increasing the dose uh, further at the, poten at the expense of potential side effects? So I only escalate the dose to a certain level 
where the desired clinical response has already been achieved. And in doing so, what are the potential benefits that I've seen from my patients? Number one, the anemia is usually not uh, a big issue. Uh, the second thing is thrombocytopenia is also not a big issue. Transfusion dependency was also reduced in those patients. In fact, this is again based off of a small number of patients, but it's quite instructive because some of the patients of mine who were initially transfusion dependent actually achieved transfusion independence, not just hemoglobin improvement, after I started the dose escalation approach. And in my simple thinking, I could think of two potential mechanisms why this may <clears throat> have happened. Because if we think about it, the JAK-STAT pathway is an important physiologic pathway for normal blood production. So if you think about it, if you inhibit it, you're supposed to decrease blood production. So you're supposed to induce some cytopenias. But I believe that the etiology or the pathogenesis of uh, anemia or cytopenias related to myelofibrosis is really multifactorial. It could be from anemia in inflammation, so inflammation resulting from all the inflammatory cytokines from the disease. Some of them are from hypersplenism. So these patients have an enlarged spleen. The, the platelets or the red cells may get trapped in the spleen, and that may be the cause of anemia. And the other thing is, of course, a factor of maybe not producing enough. But the degree at which each of these factors may be contributing to the degree of anemia may not be the same for each patient. So for that particular patient of mine where I observed that improvement, uh, it is possible that maybe I suppress, I reduce the spleen size enough to a certain level, I reduce the level of cytokines such as anemia of inflammation became less of an issue, while at the same time I'm only inhibiting the JAK-STAT pathway to a certain degree such that it's not enough to actually induce a degree of anemia and in fact, the two major contributors, which is the hypersplenism and the inflammation, I took that out of the equation and therefore they actually have improvement of their counts. Again, uh, these are preliminary observations, which I think are quite interesting. Uh, the best way to validate such findings is to do a clinical trial to try to advocate for this. But I also think that this particular abstract is something very, very important because again, it tells us that patients, even when you start at low doses, can potentially gain clinical benefit. You know, uh, we usually try to think of the primary and the secondary endpoint of the study is, but in order for us to understand the benefits, we have to somehow dissect what is contained in this, you know, the symptom assessment form that was evaluated as a secondary endpoint of the study. Because if you look at it, again, a patient may just have night sweats as their primary symptom. If that issue is actually going away with even low doses of the drug, then that may be the optimal way of approaching these patients. Another thing that I think is an important take home point from this particular treatment is that, you know, one experience that I have is that let's say a patient of mine, I started them on five milligrams uh, once daily, and they achieved their desired response for their fatigue at five milligram once a day. But then, let's say three months down the road, four months down the road, a different set of symptoms becomes a problem. Meaning, let's say the spleen now, which was previously 10 centimeters, decides to grow to become 15 or 20 centimeters, and the patient now reports more symptoms from that, maybe not so much from the fatigue, but from the spleen, it doesn't prohibit me from increasing the dose. You know, I could always increase to five twice a day if need be. And I have seen this in my patients where after I've escalated their dose, after starting from a much lower dose than previous, that I'm still able to achieve, uh, you know, therapeutic response and clinical response in these patients. So I think this is uh, quite important. Uh, you know, the way we also did the study was, you know, one of the concerns is we know that inflammatory cytokines is very important in the pathogenesis of the disease. So in a limited number of patients, we actually measured the levels of cytokines using a standard approach, uh, which is the 15 milligrams twice a day. If you have a platelet count of 100,000 to 200,000 or 20 milligrams twice a, uh, twice a day, if you have a platelet count more than 200,000, and this modified dose escalation approach where we start at five every other day for, uh, for a week and then we ask uh, for a month and then we slowly escalate. 
and we found that there was no statistically significant difference in the decrease of cytokines, suggesting to us that, again, that maybe even at low doses, you're able to actually inhibit the necessary cytokines that may be uh, causing some of the problems of these patients. And then again, this is a little bit of a small cohort and we don't necessarily have enough long-term follow-up, I think, in my opinion. But it's quite comforting to some degree that we did not see a statistically significant difference in the survival outcomes of the patients who basically have a, uh, you know, treated with the standard dose and those treated with the dose escalation approach. So I think that's quite promising. Well, this, this personalized medicine approach leaves you a lot of possibilities, I guess, you want to explore going forward. What might they be? So I think, you know, as we said, like, uh, like any other uh, treatment uh, options or initial observations uh, that are seen in clinic, you know, this is, I think, uh, one of the most important aspects I uh, consider myself as a physician scientist where I really want to see clinical observations I made in the clinic and then looking at them in the bed, you know, the bench and the bedside to try, uh, to try to see if there's going to be uh, any significant difference that we could actually make. Uh, but, you know, it's very important that uh, this needs to be validated. So we need to look at, uh, you know, hopefully clinical trials that hopefully may uh, help address this issue to provide more guidance to community physicians in order to give this particular therapy. The other thing is that I think this is a potential rational approach for patients with myelofibrosis who are not currently included in the FDA approved indication of the drug. You know, we have a lot of patients with myelofibrosis who do not have the platelet count of 50,000 or more these reserves and yet are extremely symptomatic from their disease. You cannot use the other treatment options because they carry the same problem, but their patients have, can potentially benefit from the therapy. So again, you know, from compassionate use for some of these patients, what we've seen is that, you know, we've been able to successfully treat patients with lower platelet counts and keep them on the drug uh, using this approach in a safe manner without causing any untoward side effects in this particular patient. So I think this will be a very interesting approach to try to even conduct a clinical trial that can potentially answer the question, can we successfully treat a pac patients with myelofibrosis that are symptomatic, who have platelet counts that either are between 20,000 to 50,000 or maybe even lower. But again, that's still subject to uh, you know, further evaluation, but I think this gives us room for that. And that, I think uh, it will be interesting to see if we could conduct a study just to see also that the survival outcomes of these patients, and true enough, the preliminary cytokine studies that we've observed may also potentially really be downregulated to, to a certain level that uh, we are not necessarily compromising uh, effectiveness of the treatment or in the setting of a clinical trial efficacy of the treatment uh, for these patients. Uh, again, this is more of a very early observation as well. We don't know, uh, we need to see this and validate this in a larger number of court, but again, very interesting observation is that uh, there's data showing now that the use of roxolitinib may potentially lead to a regression in fibrosis in some patients with myelofibrosis. This is very important information. And what we've seen is that when we look at the small core of patients that we have with uh, the low-dose escalation approach uh, of roxolitinib, we also saw uh, regression in the myelofibrosis score uh, in those particular patients. So again, suggesting to us that maybe that's a feasible approach for patients with myelofibrosis. Very good, sir. Dr. Tu, congratulations. I know you're excited about your yes. findings and the, and the future of creating better patient outcomes. Thanks Great. for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.